वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर महिमा नायर फैकल्टी विद द इंटरनेशनल फैमिली स्टडीज प्रोग्राम इन टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ सोशल साइंसेज टूडे वी आर लुकिंग एट द कोर्स ऑन जेंडर एंड सोशल वर्क एंड विद इन दिस कोर्स वी आर लुकिंग एट फेमिनिस्ट थियोरीज स्पेसिफिकली दिस मॉड्यूल इज ऑन साइको एनेटिक फेमिनिजम वी विल ब्रीफली गो ओवर सम ऑफ द मेन पॉइंट्स ऑफ साइको एनालिसिस एंड देन लुक एट द इन्फ्लुएंस ऑन साइको एनालिटिक फेमिनिजम सो द अजामशन दैट आई हैव इज दैट यू हैव डन सम रीडिंग ऑन फ्रॉयड एंड हैव सम बेसिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ साइको एनालिसिस नाउ द फॉर्मर दैट आई विल फॉलो फॉर टूडेज क्लास इज दैट आई विल इंट्रोड्यूस द टॉपिक टू यू एंड देन वी विल लुक एट वॉट इज साइको एनालिटिक फेमिनिजम how has it been influenced by psychoanalysis what were some of the early theories what were some of the later theories which used concepts of psychoanalysis then we will look at implications uh, in social work and look at the summarization of the entire module now the learning outcomes for this uh, module are basically describing how psychoanalytic feminism differs from classical psychoanalytic theory this is important because psychoanalytic theory was uh, if you look at the original theory it is not really the content is not uh, very pro woman per se so there were many concepts which were derogatory to women and how have by keeping the basic concepts of unconscious how have later feminist used the concept to make it for women rather than you know in terms of derogatory so it's important to understand this difference it explains the different theories of gender development and discusses the relevance of psychoanalysis to social work so something which is so theoretical and how do we use it in social work we will start with the basic concept in terms of oedipus complex being a cornerstone of gender development in psychoanalytic thinking now according to freud everybody is born with a basic sex drive or instinctual energy called the libido it is the libido which makes us do different uh, things creates the energy for us to get into creative or other kinds of aspects as well he identified five psychosocial stages of development which were oral anal phallic latency and genital so oral was where basically the focus was on the mouth anal is through your excretory organs phallic was with the genitals and latency and genital for the la later periods of life cycle now according to him the core phases of infantile sexuality occurred at the phallic stage which is between 3 to 6 years what he was saying is that between these uh, years what the children were going through influenced a lot of their sexual aspects and their growth and development now child seeks pleasure and libidinal gratification from his or her genitalia during the stage of uh, phallic uh, stage developmentally sexual orientation identification with the same sex parent occurs via an oedipus complex so basically during the phallic stage what freud had talked about was that the uh, child becomes attracted to the opposite sex parent so suppose it's a boy they will feel more attachment towards the mother and father actually becomes a figure of envy and uh, you know they resent the attention which the mother gives the father now in order to get that complete attention the son will take on the characteristics of the father will begin to identify with the father so that he can win over the complete affections of his mother now if there are any problems in doing that uh, you know taking on that identification and winning over the affections it leads to problems in later sexuality now according to freud uh, girls never completely got over the edipal phase so they would remain stuck because they were not able to because they did not have this particular organ which was the penis now we look at this further developmental issues in this stage were related to sex role identification sexuality and gender identity now classical psychoanalytic theory understood feminine development in terms of a lack of something so a lack of a penis and its initial disappointment was followed by a lack in other areas such as super ego development capacity for sublimation and moral judgment so what he was saying is that basically girls were born with a lack and this lack influenced their entire life because they could never really develop in a completely positive manner because all their growth would be influenced by this lack now in oedipus complex 
girls achieve normal sexuality by relinquishing active impulses in favor of a passive femininity. So what he was saying is that instead of being an active person, they would take on the more subordinate and the more dependent role. Because they lacked something, they would become passive and therefore were able to carry on with their lives. They would accept the absence of the penis and make up the deficiency by finding a natural substitute, which is what he called as a penis baby. So which you look in the current con uh, you know, context and understand it in simpler terms as saying, as being a son preference. So if you see why, uh, according to psychoanalysis, if you look at certain kinds of son preferences which happen in our society, these are occurring because you know, women will always lack something and this lack will only be psychologically fulfilled after they have given birth to a son. Now, uh, there are two alternatives to overcoming penis envy. Masculinity complex in which the girl rebels against the anatomical reality of castration and the passivity associated with it and seeks to appropriate masculine libido and associated qualities. So, well, you know, the girl acts more like men or you know sometimes they defined it as tomboy doing more activities like boys being more masculine the other path is the rejection of sexuality altogether the devaluation of women and womanhood in general resulting in frigidity inhibition and neurosis so in both ways what you can say is uh, there are no positive uh, outcomes to penis envy women will always have an issue and there will always be trouble according to this particular theory now, looking, you know, when we start with these concepts, why would feminism look at these concepts? Because they are obviously very, uh, they are not saying anything good for the women. But psychoanalytic feminists utilized certain concepts in uh, a different light. So they were based on his uh, psychoanalytic theory, but they maintained that gender was more psychosocial than biological. So instead of looking at particular organs, they said that it's about what was happening in the psychosocial environment. And women's oppression was rooted within the psycho psychic structures, which were influenced by psychosocial rather than only being biological in nature. It was reinforced by continual repetition of relational dynamics formed in infancy and childhood. We will discuss this in some other theories in terms of how you know certain things are repeated and therefore we take on certain roles. We'll do that in detail a little later. There's a uh, a need to alter experiences of early childhood and family relations as well as linguistic patterns that produce and reinforce masculinity and femininity. The psychoanalyst feminism were critical of Freudian and neo-Freudian notions of women as biologically, psychically and morally inferior to men. These feminists address political and social factors affecting the development of male and female subjects. Key issues addressed here were sexual difference and women's otherness in relation to men. Now the two major schools of psychoanalytic feminism are Freudian and Lacanian. Freudian feminists focus on production of male dominance and the development of gendered subjects. Lacanian feminists analyze links between gendered identity and language. In this module I have to re-emphasize again and again you will have to do a lot of readings because there are many complex concepts and I can only give you an overview over here. Now, some of the early theories, let's look at what they were saying in terms of uh, feminism. Karen Hornay focused on the social aspects of personality. So she took in the concepts of Freud, but talked about social rather than the sexual. She argued that when people do not have their needs for love and affection satisfied during childhood, they develop basic hostility towards their parent and as a consequence suffer from basic anxiety. She disagreed with Freud's description of development of a woman's personality and also the, introduced this concept called as womb envy in response to Freud's penis envy. Now womb envy was something which she said that it was men's jealousy of women's ability to bear children which caused them to overcompensate by seeking wealth and status. So according to her a lot of men and boys were continuously looking for wealth, status, greater job uh, opportunities because of their biological inability to have a child. So if you see, there are similar concepts in terms of the unconscious and the biology which is there, but it has been reinterpreted in a different manner. She refuted Freud's Oedipus complex for a, uh, you know, or a male child's detachment from and emulation of their father due to jealousy. 
and said that you know some children became jealous due to non sexual issues in the parent and child relationship so it's not only about sexual relationships but there are many other things but her critique stood within the fem you know western framework of objectivity positivism and dichotomous thinking by assuming that there were differences between men and women you know there these are two binary categories and therefore if there is no penis envy then there is womb envy now she assumed the category of women and men were uniform with no intersectionality or specific context so you know men from a certain religion caste class background women from a certain religion caste ka all this did not figure into horner's work because there was a western bent in her work as well now the later feminist theories who have written on psychoanalysis and feminism have critiqued the traditional family structure wherein women as mothers were the primary caregiver of children so what the later feminists have done is have looked at many other aspects and uh, you know to create a different theory of psychoanalytic feminism not just changed concepts around but introduced many other things now the later theories were coming in during the 1960s and 70s where these analysts placed the mother in the central position as the most powerful enviable and influential parent feminist psychoanalysis spoke about issues of identification and separation from the mother as the key to understanding both men's and women's development psychoanalytic feminism claimed that the source of men's domination of women is men's unconscious two-sided need for women's emotionality and rejection of them as potential castrators women submit to men because of their unconscious desires for emotional connectedness okay you will understand this more when we get into the theories now one of the theories was by luce irigray now she talked about female sexuality as being suppressed and prohibited as a forbidden area so she said that it was not even talked about it was only male sexuality which has been talked about and female sexuality is just you know exist only for men there is no such thing as an independent female sexuality according to freudian view uh, women have no subjectivity in sexual relationship to men for freud a little girl is a little boy with no penis thus women have been recognized as defective or lack like we discussed what freud said that you know there's a lack so now she's bringing it out strongly to say that you know there is no independent woman or no independent girl it's only a creature who's without with or without penis now eregre refers to female subjectivity and sexuality as a sexuality denied considering that penis is the only sexual organ of recognized value she argues that the complexity of female sexuality and eroticism does not fit into male notions of sexuality she discovers women's autoeroticism in her autoeroticism women is not pleasure giving but to men but self embracing so see sexuality is not about sexual relationships only it's also about pleasure living out certain uh, you know living in a certain manner making certain choices and what she said is that for uh, you know actually she brought out this fact of autoeroticism and said that women needed to embrace their own sexuality and it was not only female sexuality was not only about giving pleasure it was also about self now auto eroticism was important in her theory as she argued that freud never spoke about women's pleasure only the lack of it uh, the later theories uh, emphasize the mother and infant relationships so the first one we will look at is by nancy chotro and uh, she was one and then julia kristeva who situated their ideas on gender subjectivity and difference by emphasizing the maternal function as active in contrast to the paternal framework as reflected in freud's oedipal theory now they emphasize the importance of the pre oedipal period in formation of gender identity so you know the oedipal period was the phallic period between 3 to 6 years they were saying that the years before that were important in formation of gender identity Now, according to Chodro, gendered personalities are the outcome of Oedipus complex, that is, the separation from the mother. Women are the primary parents, and infants bond with them. Boys have to separate from their mothers and identify with their fathers in order to establish their mas- masculinity. They develop strong ego boundaries and a capacity for independent action, objectivity, rational thinking, which is very valued in Western culture. women can be seen as a threat to their independence and masculine sexuality 
Now, she argued that as a result of asymmetrical parenting, both girls and boys come to define themselves in relation to the mother. What she meant by asymmetrical parenting was that usually when only mothers are the primary caregivers. So, fathers have a very uh, peripheral role in bringing up children. And when the mother is the primary caregiver, both boys and girls have to identify with her because she is the present parent. Now, girl psychic structure develops within this context of identification on the basis of similarity with the mother. Whereas boys construct their identity on the basis of difference. Now, this was the important thing according to her saying it was easier for girls to develop an identity because they had to relate to a present parent. Whereas boys, although they spent most of the time with the mother, had to develop an identity which was different from her. So for them, it was actually more difficult. Negation is held to create difficulties for masculine identity, which is seen as being threatened by experiences that re-evoke early maternal identification, whereas girls are seen as being more secure in their positive identification with their mothers. So it's important to understand this concept. What she was saying is that for boys, the development was related to negation. So ultimately, when they grew up, they would get more anxious because their first attachment and understanding was with the mother. So, you know, the identification was also with the mother because that's who they were with throughout. For girls, it was easier because they just kept following that and they felt more secure in their identification with the present parent. Whereas boys had to continuously, you know, this gave rise to anxiety to say that, yes, this is the first instinct to follow what this parent is doing. But actually, because I'm a boy, I have to do something different from this parent. Identification. Now, for girls, how did that create an issue? She said that identification with a less valued figure created problems for women's sense of power and agency rather than their gender identity as girls will struggle to claim for herself what her mother was denied, a voice of her own, a mind of her own, a life of her own. So she's not saying that there is no problem in the development of girls. She's saying that there is a problem because they are, they have to identify with a less argue, uh, you know, powerful figure in society. So automatically they learn to see themselves as secondary citizens and therefore, uh, you know, in the un from the very beginning, the unconscious has this fact they are ready to accept certain things because they are secondary citizens. Now, she advocated the concept of shared parenting, wherein women and men actively participate in early child care. This would allow the male to develop parenting capacities and allow boys to identify with their father on the basis of a real tie. So she said that if both parents took on equal roles, boys would also have an active parent present with whom they could identify with and actually have a real emotional connect with also. Gender identities would then be more stable. Now she has been criticized for focusing only on psychological concepts and ignoring the intersections between the psychological and social. Some of these aspects were then covered by later theorists. Now, uh, the other person who was looking at mother-infant relationships was Julia Kristeva, who proposed that the maternal discourse was constructed on a pre-symbolic mental experience in relation to the development of the self. Uh, this will become clearer gradually. She defines subjectivity as shifting and multifaceted. So she says that, you know, things are not stable things are always shifting and there are multiple layers to it. She focused on maternity, maternal body rhythms and language in the formation of gender identity, emphasized the role of language in construction on femininity. So see, what she was bringing out is that how we speak, what is the language that we speak, what are the words that we use are important in how feminine, femininity is constructed. So it is, you know, the existing language influences development of a child, which is pre-symbolic, which meant that, you know, it started influencing the child very early on in their lives. So whatever was spoken around them had an influence on this child. Now, Christina maintained that language originated from symbolic and semiotic coda. Now, symbolic is described as the patriarchal voice, which is constructed to suit the masculine needs and is delivered in public spaces and therefore forms the public life. So, you know, this is again language, which she's saying symbolic is the patriarchal voices. So, when we look at spaces and we say that, you know, these spaces appear accessible to uh, women or they don't, or what is, you know, what is a women-friendly space? 
So she says that spaces itself had a patriarchal voice and therefore, you know, they were delivered in public uh, spaces and that made a difference to how women grew. Let me try and simplify this a bit because if you look at advertising and what is the public space advertising doing? So if you have washing machines or if you have kitchen utensils, you will always have primarily uh, women selling the product or women using it. So anybody seeing, uh, you know, grows up on these ads knows or, you know, imagines that that's the normal role of women. They are the ones who are going to wash the clothes, you know, all the washing powder detergents or washing machines, everything. That's a public voice and that comes into the unconscious of the person. You know, that's one example of a public voice where the media also gives these messages and people incorporate this is the role of boys, this is the role of girls. Now, for her, that is the symbolic language which children are developing with. The other part that she talked about is the semiotic Kora, uh, which she says acquisition of symbolic language, which is developmentally pre-language. Semiotic language forms a part of the unconscious of the individual. Tristeva argues that language in this realm is constructed from symbi symbiotic experience between infant and mother. It provides subjects with an alternative linguistic process to existing language pattern. This realm could conflict with masculine voice spoken in public as it is present in the individual at the pre-language stage. See, what she's saying is that there is another kind of language which is developing because of the bond between the mother and infant. Now, remember, psychoanalysis gives a lot of focus on unconscious. So, whatever the unconscious is taking in in this mother-infant relationship, some of the things may be conflicting with what the outer voice is saying. And this can sometimes lead to anxiety. Now, in order to really understand her work, you have to go through the text. And beyond the text, you have to go through several readings. Because, uh, you know, there are complex things that psychoanalytic uh, theorists are saying and they need to be read much more to understand the depth. Now, Christopher's work, uh, this very thing of pre-language and symbolic thing, was it was criticized for that because uh, other people said that, you know, it presupposes a maternal instinct as something prior to culture. So, what the other feminists or later feminists have said is that there is no a biological maternal instinct which is prior to culture it is the cultural message actually it's actually a symbolic patriarchal voice of the world which says that you know there is a maternal instinct and that is what all women have which may which actually is not true this maternal instinct they're saying is a cultural message and many women may not have the maternal instinct itself so feminists like judith butler have challenged that a maternal body and a maternal instinct is actually constructed through specific power relations within the culture itself. She argues that it is important to understand the production of the maternal body itself. Now, Judith Butler rejected the view that gender differences with their accompanying presumptions of heterosexuality have their origin in biological or natural differences. So for her, nothing was biological or natural. What she's saying is everything comes in because of the cultural aspect. She explores uh, what does it mean to have a unity of biological sex, gendered identification and heterosexuality comes to appear natural. How, you know, how do these things appear natural? Because from the very beginning in the development, uh, they have been present. So we all think that heterosexuality is normal and that is the norm then gender divisions are normal. What she says is these are not normal or from the very beginning, but it's our, these are all cultural constructions. And how do they happen? So she says, gender ought not to be constructed as a stable identity or locus of agency from where, which various acts follow. Rather, gender is an identity tenuously constitu constituted in time, instituted in an exterior space, through a stylized repetition of acts. So there are several important things that she's saying that gender is not a stable identity. It can change with development. It does not have this one locus of agency. It's, it's actually very tenuous. So there is no gender identity. So various points of development, you may question your gender identity. And it's actually instituted in an exterior space. That is, it's not internal or pre-born. It is 
constitute through a stylized repetition of acts. We we'll understand this more. What does she mean by this stylized repetition of acts? She says, she gave an example where she says when a baby is born and it's an announced that it's a girl, she is not reporting an already determ determinate state of affairs, but taking part in a practice which constitutes that state of affairs. Which means that, you know, if culturally we said it's, if we had given it some other name saying, it's a girl or it's a boy, it's culture which has given that definition. So already when she announces it's a girl, a, there is a creation of a gender identity. If the name had been changed to say that it's not a girl or it's a bottle or something, it's language which is creating a girl and when she says a girl, immediately a certain picture pops up into our head because that's how girls have been defined. The effect of repetition of acts of this kind is to make it appear that there are two distinct natures, male and females. So the messages that children get, the clothes that they wear, you know, blue clothes for boys, pink clothes for girls, the kind of toys to be given to boys, kind of toys to be, dolls should be given to girls. This is called as the stylized repetition of acts. So continuously we give boys a certain messages that, okay, these are the toys, these are the clothes that you wear and we give similar messages to girls. And through this stylized repetition of act, we create two binary genders, which is male and female. Which, uh, you know, these repetition of acts is gendered performances that we act out and which others act out in relation to us, which don't just exist. Now, social scripts prescribe the ideals for these performances and provide a framework within which we act. Again, for example, women wear saris in certain situations as that can be an accepted mode of dressing. But if a man wears a sari, this, was, this would be considered away from the norm. It's not that a man cannot wear, but it's, it's the message that he cannot wear. What we wear, how we speak, think is mostly within a framework that a social setup provides us and we are acting that out. These dominant ideals reinforce the power of certain groups, that is men and heterosexuals over others. The others like women, homosexuals, transsexuals, those with disabled bodies or differently shaped bodies, uh, different from the dominant ideal, are treated socially as outsiders. Now Butler brings out this aspect of presumptive heterosexuality and also reflects on class, race, cultural positioning as well as age. For her, you know, a middle class woman in India will perform her femininity in a very different way from a woman from a Dalit background in the village. This also differs in state and regions. That's why she's saying it's not a stable identity. There are many differences in terms of the uh, class context. So she's bringing in intersections to gender. Gender performances are open to destabilization and change. It becomes a matter of bodily style and performance. There is no necessary link between gender and any particular bodily shape. So performing gender is different from having a particular body. Alignment between anatom anatomical shape and gendered performance itself is just a norm. Sex differences are not simply given. For biology itself does not escape the discursive formation. Divisions of bodies into just two sexes uh, for Butler is driven by a set of heterosexual gendered norms. It is not dictated by nature, taken to lie outside of these norms. Now, what are the implications of uh, psychoanalysis to social work? How do we use the concepts which seem appear very theoretical to this practice of social work? Now, why is it important is because psychoanalytic feminists, especially the later ones, uh, question the existing categorizations based on sex, gender, caste, class, which is what social workers are also doing and trying to bring in an equality in society. They question a construction of world on binary categories. So there are no stable categories. There are many fused categories and which is what we need to work with. Now, Mitchell has suggested that we inherit ideas and laws of human society within unconscious mind ideas about patriarchy and then live them as if they were real. So we inherit certain ideas and we believe all this is the reality. Actually what social workers are also doing is questioning the existing realities and saying that the world can be different, the world can be more equitable so that everybody has equal powers and resources and therefore we also need to get back into unconscious to see where these thoughts are coming from. Patriarchal ideology is transmitted within families through generations it's important, especially when we work with women who cannot be seen as individuals. They have to be seen in the social context and where they belong to. And looking at this again, person in environment principle. It's important to understand the role of unconscious 
while working on issues related to religion and health as often it's difficult to understand an individual's motivation and behavior while working on these issues so as social workers we can get lost if we don't get into some of these aspects of unconscious especially when we are working with religion and health issues where do people seek help why do they go where they go now psychoanalytic feminism emphasizes that there is a need to understand individual and social psyche that a person carries within them and the manner in which linguistic categories impact the thought processes and practices it emphasizes that there is no norm and all categories are shifting transitory unstable and this would help the social workers to avoid polarization in practice if we summarize if we look at the entire module this module is bringing out the manner in which classical psychoanalytic theory of freud has been reworked psychoanalytic feminism focused on the concepts of mothering gendered body language to understand how gender identities are created and sustained it looks at passivity narcissism masochism on one hand and dependency and inability of finding one's voice which uh, you know pose a particular problem for women they also argue that personality styles are associated with feminine disorders such as depression somatic disorders eating disorders aggression against the self so you know if the, when women are defined in a certain manner these are the kind of issues that also come up contemporary analysts attempt to free the association between vulnerabilities from gender through the development of psychology for women which allows for a more active female subject and it also allows for a construction of a creative gender identity not just two binary categories of men and women but more creative things and other identities could also exist which also depend on caste class region religion incorporating identifications from both parents rather than an adhesive identification with the surface qualities and superficial aspect of socially defined gender codes so what they're saying is also this concept of shared parenting to say that you know uh, both parents take an equal role and help the in the development of the children so this module is basically looking at you know understanding unconscious aspects and development of children and how there is a need to incorporate this in practice so that we avoid a practice which is polarized that is we avoid practice which is which exists on basic stereotypes thank you for paying attention to the module and uh, it's important for you to go through the readings there are links provided in terms of even judith butler's theory please go through those uh, video links in order to further understand psychoanalytic feminism thank you